We are at Wayne State University right now awaiting the arrival of Vice President Al Gore. He's going to be addressing the conference at about one o'clock in the afternoon and we'll have that for you live here of course on Great Lakes. Now earlier this morning uh, areas of concern conference over across town a little bit in Detroit at the Weston Book Cadillac Hotel. They kicked off their conference this morning and Rachel Jacobson gave a keynote address. She's the acting assistant secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks with the U.S. Department of the Interior. Let's go ahead and take a listen to what she had to say a little earlier this morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you, Cam, for that very nice introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'm so excited to appear before you uh, here today. I've only been the acting assistant secretary for a couple of months. They uh, pulled me out of my usual job at Interior as the, the number two lawyer to take on this policy job. And it's only really been a couple of months. But when I heard I had the opportunity to work on the Great Lakes, I, I, that, that made it, to be honest with you, because I'm very excited to do this. So thank you also to the commission for issuing this invitation to talk with you about what Interior is doing to help on the habitat restoration front, which is such an essential part of addressing these AOCs. And what I'm going to do is just give you some examples of areas where we are uh, working on habitat restoration and also engaged in a lot of other scientific research um, to address AOCs. I really want to also thank all of you in the audience who are our key partners in our efforts. And no one can do this alone. And I think the, the theme you've heard today, the theme you've heard throughout the week is, is bears repeating, and that is that this is a collaborative effort, and uh, together we are, we are better than we are individually. So thank you all for working with Interior in, uh, in everything we're trying to do to address these areas of concern. Um, these are very complicated conservation challenges and, and it's the Department of Interior professionals for our agency who really have, have dedicated their careers to addressing these conservation challenges. So I really want to thank the professionals at Interior for the work they do. And a special shout out to, uh, uh, to Charlie Woolley and to Leon Carl for helping me prepare these remarks and, and getting me up to speed on a lot of the work we're doing in the field. Uh, the, the work you're doing is of great interest to me, both personally and professionally. Um, it's of great interest to me personally because I'm a native Chicagoan. I was born and raised in Chicago, and my entire family, without exception, still reside in the Chicago area. I'm the only one to have left, because you know you don't leave Chicago, by the way, so, um, or you return eventually. So I'm still um, supposed to get back there at some point. So I, I am a native Chicagoan, and uh, when I look back, I realize how our, our lives very much revolved around the lake. We never called it Lake Michigan. It was the lake. And it, the lake was ever-present but never taken for granted. The lake dictated our weather. The lake was very much dictated our weather, by the way. Um, the lake was our recreational hub, as long as there weren't too many dead fish washed ashore uh, on the beach. And it was our sense of place. As a kid, I could not imagine that there could be a bigger shoreline or a larger body of water anywhere in the world. Um, and I now know from, from reviewing EPA's uh, Illinois, the Illinois EPA website, because I thought to myself, well, how, how much of Lake Michigan really is it in, in the Chicago area? I, I hadn't really, I mean, I've looked at maps, I've you know, been around the world, but that one fact I'd never really looked at. And it turns out that I now know that the Illinois portion of Lake Michigan is only 100 square miles, which translates to only 0.22% of the total size and only accounts for 0.1% of the total area of the state of Illinois. Furthermore, the Lake Michigan coastline is only 63 miles long, which is a fraction of the 1,640 miles that make up the Lake Michigan shoreline. So I'm sure many Chicagoans would be surprised to learn, as I was, that our piece of Lake Michigan is so minuscule. Uh, for me, the lake provided my own personal navigational tool. If I'm heading toward the lake, I'm going east. If I'm heading away from the lake, I'm going west. If the lake is on my right, I'm going north. And if the lake is on my left, I'm going south. That, that's it. That's what more do you need to know, right? 
So my husband says I'm directionally challenged, but I explain to him there's, the problem is there's no lake in D.C. to provide me a compass. Uh, the second reason your work resonates with me personally is because I spent the vast majority of my career suing polluters under federal environmental laws while I was at the Justice Department. Now, the way we were divided at Justice, we were divided to coincide with EPA regions, and I never got the opportunity to work with Region 5. So while I sued polluters in Alaska and in Idaho and in Colorado and Montana and Utah and Pennsylvania and Delaware and Maryland, I never got to sue polluters in this region. So I'm finally not really getting my chance to sue polluters, but to engage on these important issues. But, but because of that, I understand that what's key to the success of what you are doing is also making sure that those who contributed to the pollution pay for remediation and restoration wherever possible. Um, for Fish and Wildlife Service and our partner trustees, uh, such as the states and tribes where, uh, who engage in natural resource damage assessment under the CERCLA statute, we, this has resulted in the recovery of funds from polluters on, on the restoration side, and I know that EPA and the states and tribes and others have also been seeking to recover funds from polluters on the remediation side. But I'm, I'm very pleased to see that part of, that we're, we're, we're matching these monies, some of these natural resource damage monies, for important habitat assessment work on the AOCs where you are working and sometimes using legacy funding and other funding, and I'll give some examples of that in a minute. Um, you know, I've been thinking lately about the public trust doctrine. Do anybody know, does anybody know what that is? Or has anybody heard of that? Many of you. Well, that's good because sometimes we forget about it and it's a doctrine derived um, from philosophy and common law and it stands for the principle that there are societal values that certain natural resources are held in trust by the sovereign to be protected for the common public good and for the enjoyment of future generations. And the way I see our work at Interior and what all of you are doing is upholding that, that public trust and it's so important that we do so. So anyway, getting on to the, the examples that I want to provide to you today about the AOCs and Interior's role. Um, as you all know, the AOCs represent subregions throughout the Great Lakes that are priority areas for provincials, tribal and state agencies and federal agencies, but also for, for stakeholders such as industry, local communities, and other stakeholders. And for Interior, we're bringing to bear a wide array of authorities and programs and expertise and our on-the-ground presence to help restore areas and eliminate beneficial use impairments to ultimately lead to delisting of these AOCs. Within the Interior Department, bureaus like the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are directly engaged in work to ad address fish and wildlife needs within the AOCs. However, other Interior bureaus, such as the National Park Service and Bureau of Indian Affairs, are also addressing a variety of landscape-level Great Lakes issues that benefit areas of concern. Our landscape work on invasive species, environmental contamination, habitat conservation, renewable energy, all contribute eventually, we hope, to sustainable fish and wildlife populations to benefit the entire Great Lake Basin, including the AOCs. When it comes to the 30 areas of concern found in the U.S. or shared with U.S. and Canada, those of you here in this room know more than anyone that getting the work done depends on a collaborative work of many, many people. Um, and it, in this way, as we've all, again, the theme of the week is take action together, but take action. So again, we ha that the, these themes are worth repeating. So if you hear me saying things that you've heard all week and you've heard again this morning, I, I, there, there's, this is our language, this is what we say. So the, the need, obviously, to remove beneficial use impairments and realize the delisting of AOCs is real and immediate. And for our mission at Interior, which is to protect America's natural resources and heritage and honor our cultures and tribal communities, this work is imperative for us. 
So under, I, I've read the uh, U.S.-Canadian Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and I, it, it, it's a very interesting document. And I noticed in it, I counted 10 um, of the beneficial use impairments. I counted 10 of the 14 that are central to the mission of several interior bureaus, and, and in particular, um, the loss of habitat, deformities and degradation of fish and wildlife populations that are criteria for putting AOCs on the map are uh, central to DOI's authorities to address those kinds of issues to delist the AOC. So, so obviously dredging and removal and contamination is not enough. If we want to see fish populations increase, we also have to engage in active restoration measures, and that's much of what we are doing. I have more examples than I could possibly take the time today to recount about our efforts, but I'm going to just highlight a few. The Ashtabula River, the St. Louis River, the Detroit and St. Clair Rivers, the Grand Calumet, and the Black Rivers. And I'm only going to say a couple things about a few, so don't get nervous that we're going to be here for, you know, all day long. Um, and I'm also going to highlight just briefly some of the cross-cutting scientific work our scientists are doing along with you, uh, the scientific work that's very critical to providing key background data and information toward delisting. In the Ashtabula River AOC in Ohio, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service works shoulder sh sh shoulder with uh, the EPA, U.S. EPA, and the Ashtabula Partnership, the Ohio EPA, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And our, um, through our collective efforts and a natural resource damage settlement under CERCLA, um, this is going back to the theme of making sure polluters pay where we can find them, we were able to protect and restore more than 330 acres of river habitat. And follow-up testing three years after dredging showed a tenfold reduction in water column PCB concentrations. We're still documenting and resulting the physiological improvements to fish and wildlife communities, but we're very pleased with the results we've seen thus far. And in the Ashtabula, our collective work in these, in these restoration measures contributed to the removal of the following five categories of beneficial use impairments. Loss of fish and wildlife habitat, degraded fish and wildlife populations, degradation of benthos, fish and tumor deformities, and bird or animal deformities or reproductive problems. So we've, we've contributed to the that five of the beneficial use impairments to improve the Ashtabula, which is now well on its way to being delisted. The St. Louis River AOC in Minnesota is also well on its way to BUI removals, beneficial use impairment. Forgive me if I slip into the acronyms, but you are all well familiar with them, I'm sure, and uh, you'll forgive me. Um, and this is, again, an outstanding uh, collaborative effort there, with the Fish and Wildlife Service working with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, the St. Louis River Alliance Habitat Work Group, the Minnesota Land Trust, the Metropolitan Interstate Council Harbor Technical Advisory Committee, the University of Minnesota Natural Resource Institute, and other local experts, all of whom together are helping to provide ecological design scenarios for inclusion in the remediation feasibility analysis. This work will help guide next steps for sediment remediation and habitat reconstruction, because where we can find ways to do those simultaneously, then we're obviously ahead of the game. And will help remove fish consumption advisories, stem the loss of fish and wildlife habitat, and improved degraded fish and wildlife population, again, some of the beneficial use impairments listed, the benthos and the fish tumors and deformities. We hope to improve all of that through this collaborative work. Um, with respect to the St. Louis River, I'm also happy to say that on August 23rd of this year, the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, together with the Nature Conservancy in Wisconsin and Minnesota, announced the permanent protection of the largest island in St. Louis River estuary. Uh, Clough Island, which is a 358-acre haven for wildlife, including, including native fish and migratory and breeding birds, was described by Fish and Wildlife Service Midwest 
D Regional Director Tom Milley as, as a natural resource jewel in the St. Louis River estuary with a natural beauty unlike any in the upper Midwest. Tom went on to say that the unparalleled, unparalleled cooperation between Minnesota and Wisconsin natural resource agencies, the Nature Conservancy, and federal partners exemplifies exceptional strategic conservation. Together we are enhancing and restoring wildlife and habitat and promoting the hunting, fishing, bird watching, and, wild, and wildlife dependent activities of the area for future generations. Preservation of Clough Island is considered a huge step toward delisting the St. Louis River as an area of concern. The Detroit and St. Clair rivers um, were once thriving fisheries, as you all well know, until the loss of suitable habitat altered their productivity. I saw a reference when I was um, doing some research for this talk that referred to the Detroit River as a sewer shed, and I, I, that's an absolutely wrenching description. Uh, how, how could that ha have happened? Uh, I, I did have the privilege just in the couple of days I've been here to experience the Detroit River from a really terrific riverboat cruise the other night and uh, also thank you to the Army Corps of Engineers from a helicopter tour and while clearly there's still work to be done I mean that the, the gains and the improvements are really incredible and terrific and, and just a pleasure to witness um, but I was going to talk more specifically about what uh, USGS and, and others have been doing in this area. So, so the USGS, if you may know this, but it bears mention, um, with, together with others are, are conducting fish habitat restoration in the Detroit River uh, by uh, installing two spawning reefs at carefully selected locations. And the monitoring at these reefs has demonstrated already a beginning of a return to healthy fish populations with uh, documented lake sturgeon, whitefish, walleye, and 14 other native fish are spawning on these reefs. And scientists have observed thousands of viable eggs, so we think that's terrific. Um, obviously, this new fish habitat has resulted in progress toward addressing the loss of fish and wildlife habitat BUI for the Detroit River. And based on that success, the USGS and the Michigan Sea Grant are now constructing fish spawning habitat in the middle channel of the St. Clair River using these proven scientific methods that were developed for the construction of the reef projects on the Detroit River. In addition, the USGS has developed a blueprint for fish habitat that identifies sites suitable for spawning of uh, native species, you know, using this same uh, uh, approach. So in the long run, you know, this basic research and these, these well, we might call them even pilot projects, are going to go a long way toward improving fish habitat throughout the AOCs. Another example of Interior's work on AOCs is the Saginaw Bay and Raisin River AOC in Michigan which are part of a comprehensive assessment of the effect of contaminants on colonial water bird population, reproduction, and health. Projects such as this will lay the groundwork for future remedial restoration projects at all AOCs with colonial water birds. In the same area, that is the, the River Raisin, Raisin area, the National Park Service has a newly established River Raisin National Battlefield Park in Monroe, Michigan. And the park will provide public access and recreation in the area. And by establishing a new unit of the Park Service, this brings another important partner, a key partner, to restoration of the area of concern and another steward of the environment. So where we can engage in this sort of protection and, and allow that sort of stewardship into the future, uh, of, such as through designating parks and, and wildlife refuges and other areas. We, well, we, where we have that opportunity, we'll certainly look to do so. Of course, before any habitat restoration can begin, it's necessary to identify financial resources, as we all know, for project implementation. In the Grand Calumet, work began this past June to remove 252,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment from the west branch of the Cal Grand Calumet and River and Roxana Marsh. This project will dredge 
More than a mile of river and a cap will be placed over remaining sediments. To pay for the $50 million project, uh, and this, these are the kind of stories I think are just terrific, the Great Lakes Legacy Act provided $32.5 million in funding and a CERCLA natural resource damage settlement uh, with funds recovered by the Fish and Wildlife Service in the state of Indiana as co-trustees provided another $17.5 million. With an expected completion date in the summer of 2012, the Grand Calumet provides an important reminder that cost sharing and leveraging resources are instrumental to completing projects in a timely matter, uh, manner. Um, because in these very tough economic climates, partnerships and pooling of resources will safeguard these restoration progress. And the sooner we restore, the more resilient the, the ecosystem, the cheaper it is to keep restoring. That, there's no simple, simpler way of putting it. Uh, so now more than ever, we have to strengthen our working relationships and put on our thinking caps and, and be imaginative and creative about different revenue streams that we can pool together. Now for many AOCs, such as the Black River, there's still much work to be done. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other project partners are continue to look for funding to restore the Black River habitat. Uh, we're happy to say that a, in a, a 2011 uh, grant from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, will fund assessment and design of a restoration project. So thank you to NOAA for sharing your environmental expertise, uh, which is unparalleled, and your funding at this and a other AOC sites. While site-specific projects, such as those I've highlighted, are important, there's a lot of cross-cutting, really cutting-edge scientific work going on at Interior together with its partners. And this science is generating foundational information across AOCs to support delisting. For example, our Great Lakes Restoration Initiative-funded Contaminants of Emerging Concern Project is at the forefront of science to identify and curtail the DDTs and PCBs of the future. Underscoring the connection between AOCs and the health of fish and wildlife, the emerging contaminants work gathers information at multiple AOCs, not only to evaluate the presence of emerging contaminants, but also to evaluate effects of these contaminants on fish and wildlife. Data indicating fish tumors, deformities, and the like can then be utilized in the removal of beneficial use impairments. So it's, it's this foundational work that lets us engage in strategic restoration and, and strategic remediation. It, and this just draw, draws attention to the important research, and, and we can't underscore the importance of research and the need for research funding. It's, and, and I think somebody mentioned that we can't afford to, even though uh, uh, environmental protection might seem like a luxury in, in hard economic times with tight budgets, we also can't underscore the importance of research, because if we don't have that foundational research, we don't have a guiding light for what we are doing. So research funding is key. And uh, for DOI, we, our research and our work is always supported by the best, best available science. And if it wasn't before, we are fixing it now. I promise you that. Um, I also want to highlight uh, some of the work that you, uh, more work that USGS is studying, uh, is, is performing right now. In a particular, a study uh, of a project entitled Birds as Indicators of Contaminant Exposure in the Great Lakes, which is determining uh, the exposure risks and the effect of historical and emerging contaminants on birds. And, and so by doing so, looking at what the Great Lakes food chain uh, is experiencing by birds is a key indicator. Um, obviously, the, the effects on, of environmental contaminants on birds were first brought to the nation's attention by Rachel Carson in her book, Silent Spring. And since then, birds have used, been used very effectively. It's the you know, quintessential canary in the coal mine um, in contaminant effects and assessments. And this project that, fish, that, again, USGS is leading is uh, providing data for, for two specific and important BUIs, degradation of fish and wildlife populations and bird or 
animal deformities or reproductive problems that, again, can be applied across AOCs. DOI scientists are using their expertise in sampling and analyzing mercury and other legacy toxic chemicals um, in, in many, almost 59 of the largest tributaries to the Great Lakes. And just this week, we were reminded by the report released by the Great Lakes Commission that mercury persists at an unacceptably high level in many Great Lakes fish. And it's disheartening to, to hear that after all the work that EPA and others have been doing to reduce mercury contamination both atmospherically and depositionally, that it still persists in the fish. So we, we got more to work to do. Um, we, we, so we provide science needs by, with uh, critical water quality and biological information and other decision-making tools that will help the EPA determine remediation strategies and help all of us together determine restoration strategies toward AOC delisting. Theodore Roosevelt once said, in utilizing and conserving natural resources of the nation, the one characteristic more essential than any is foresight. Your foresight will restore this important region and help Great Lakes communities and ecosystems stay healthy well into the future. And again, this is something we've been hearing before, but it bears repeating. The environmental health of the Great Lakes is inseparable from the health of the Great Lakes communities. In a recent Sea Grant study released by the University of Michigan, it was found that more than 1.5 million jobs and $62 billion in annual wages are tied to the Great Lakes. Through our AOC work, uh, DOI is helping to do our part to work with all of you to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants and habitats so that the local economies which rely on activities such as outdoor recreation, tourism, and commercial fishing can thrive for generations to come. Through DOI and all of you as partners, we've made strides in remo removing BUIs, as I've mentioned, toward eventual delisting. And I, I have to say that in the last day and a half, I've met so many of you and spoken to so many of you, and I'm thrilled to hear about the work you're doing. It is just really cool, amazing stuff. And I think you have to continue to tell your story. That's been another theme here today. I mean, you, you're all sort of, you know, toiling in silence in the world, and the, certainly our, our lawmakers need to recognize the important work you're doing. So get out there. And, and tell the story, um, and the health of this ecosystem and this community is dependent on you. Under the public trust doctrine, this is our responsibility. So in closing, thank you for your time, for your attention, for your incredible spirit of collaboration, and let's get out there and get these AOCs delisted. Thank you so much. And you have been watching Rachel Jacobson address the crowd during Great Lakes Week here in Detroit, and you are watching Great Lakes Now on greatlakesnow.org.